He is a man with many missions. He wants to transform his country with oil and gas revenue, but still stay on the low carbon path. He's raising his voice to make his region a zone of peace, and he's not afraid to articulate his country's independent foreign policy. Welcome to Leaders Talk with this exclusive with Dr. Muhammad Irfan Ali, President of Guyana. Hello and welcome to Leaders Talk, where we meet leaders, thinkers, and trailblazers. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Today we look at China's presence in Latin America and the Caribbean. Is China overstretching or is the West overreacting? My guest today is Dr. Irfan Ali, President of Guyana. It's almost 80% forest. It's the only English-speaking country of South America. Its diverse ethnic makeup reflects centuries of colonial rule and social progress in the Caribbean region. Its economy was struggling, and it's about to change. It is Guyana. Records show that as early as 1853, Chinese immigrants set foot on modern-day Guyana. Some stayed after their ordeal, and in nearly 170 years, made their mark in the medical field, commerce, law, agriculture, education, and the general infrastructure of Guyana. In fact, Guyana's first president as an independent nation was an ethnic Chinese, the late president Arthur Chung. On October the 1st, 2020, shortly after Dr. Irfan Ali was elected, he congratulated China's National Day and pledged to strengthen the bilateral relationship on the economic, political, and social fronts. Dr. Irfan Ali, president of Guyana, it is an absolute honor to have you on our program. Thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here, and I thank you for welcoming, welcoming me on your program. How would you describe the current state of China-Guyana relationship? Where is it today? Well, I would say the Guyana-China relationship has been an evolution, and that evolution would have led to uh, many positive outcomes. So it is not a relationship that is built only on uh, economic prosperity is a relationship that has a social component. It's a relationship that has a political component. And it's a relationship that has led to the advancement of both countries. As you know, uh, China is an important development partner for Guyana. China is an important bilateral partner. But also, Guyana is a, is a country that hosts a lot of Chinese businesses. And not only businesses at a large infrastructure scale, but businesses that uh, participate in trade at a medium size. Uh, so the Chinese business community is integrally integrated into the economic and social framework of Guyana. President Ali, recently you remarked that China-Guyana relations are imperishable. And this relationship is based on, quote unquote, our shared ties of blood and history. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? We are not only hosts to Chinese investment. We have people to people link. We have uh, the Chinese are part of our country. They are part of the diversity of our country. They are part of the diverseness of our country. They are part of the bloodline of our country. So. Uh, the, when I said that, I meant that from a people perspective, from a cultural perspective, from a human perspective, China is an equal part of Guyana because they make up the six people. Yeah, I know in the Guyanese national anthem, uh, one line really sticks out to me. That is, uh, one land of six peoples, united and free. And of course, Chinese being one of those six peoples. Uh, in what ways do you think uh, people with Chinese heritage have shaped Guyana to become what it is today over the past years, decades, and centuries? In every area, if you look at uh, the trade and commerce, 
uh, you will see a lot of Chinese investors and investment in that area, infrastructure transformation, technology, agriculture, cultural uh, integration and transformation, uh, human resource transformation in providing um, uh, uh, educational opportunities and being part of the uh, economic and, uh, and social transformation of our country driven on an educational platform. So I would say that the contribution is rich and diverse as the six people of our country in every area of development, in, any, in every area of advancement in the country, you would see Chinese investors or uh, Chinese uh, nationals playing an important part. In our cuisine, uh, mm -hmm. we are known in the, in the region to have the best Chinese food, and we have some um, very um, elaborate investment in the hospitality and, and uh, sector especially in restaurants. So Chinese investment has influenced uh, all aspects of national life. And it's not only national life at the center. You can go to one of the most uh, remote areas of Guyana, or you can go to even uh, areas in the hinterland. Let us look at um, Lethem, which is on, on the border with Brazil, mm -hmm. and it's in Region 9. You will see not only Chinese restaurants, you'll see Chinese businesses, a hardware store, retail centers. And that is because of the way we have also treated Chinese investors and, and, and Chinese nationals themselves, and even those uh, who, who come in from time to time. We have always provided an equal platform. We have always provided a respectful platform in which the investment in which uh, their presence was not only welcome, but it was supported. Yeah, Mr. President, I want to talk about a very important event in history. Guyana was the first English-speaking Caribbean country to recognize People's Republic of China uh, in 1972. That was only a very short year, few years after Guyana itself gained national independence and become, became a republic. What made Guyana decide to do that? And as the country's current president, looking back, how do you feel about that decision? Well, uh, let me start from the second part of your question. We always value deeply the decision to um, bring our countries together uh, through diplomatic channels. Uh, we saw that uh, decision then, and we continue to see that decision as an important part of our presence in the global community. China and Guyana relationship evolved over time, but that relationship in initial years was structured uh, around uh, political, trade, economic uh, kind of sphere with uh, <clears throat> support for the country's development agenda and, and supporting the transformation of human resources through educational opportunities and cultural exchange. But as, uh, as, as time went by and things evolved, Guyana became an important destination also, major partner in terms of the transfer of technology, knowledge, and, uh, and support for the infrastructural transformation of our country. More recently, uh, we have a Chinese form as part of the consortium in a new sector, the new oil and gas sector. So in every phase of the development of the country, uh, the presence of China uh, was there and continues to be there. The initial relationship evolved and blossomed into a relationship that has been uh, diver diverse, multifaceted, and has opened up new channels of cooperation and collaboration and new opportunities for the advancement of the people of both countries. Uh, Mr. President, I want to come back to the question of, uh, you know, one China principle. Uh, we know Guyana was, uh, of course, the first English-speaking Caribbean country to recognize uh, PRC. Um, some countries, for example, decided to, you know, have one of their most senior uh, officials to visit Taiwan uh, against the indignation of Beijing. Um, you know, that has, of course, caused huge controversy and escalated tensions in the region. How important is it, in your opinion, to abide by and stick with the One China Principle? Well, we have made it very clear that we continue to respect the One China Principle and the One China Policy. 
that is part of our uh, policy agenda. <clears throat> this is our position uh, internationally, and we believe that the One China policy is important for uh, not only for China, but for the stability of the region, but more importantly, we believe that the region itself, as we, as we work in a global community, the region must find ways in which uh, there can be deeper partnership and deeper collaboration so that uh, the zone can remain a zone of peace. Uh, in the Caribbean, that is where we are um, emphasizing and, and putting a lot of our, our time and effort ensuring that our uh, international framework and our bilateral and multilateral partners understand that we want the Caribbean region to remain a zone of peace. Similarly, I think that uh, the, what we are seeing in, the, in Europe now uh, with the invasion in, in Ukraine uh, cannot be replicated. The world cannot afford for this to be replicated anywhere. So we have to work on a framework of respect, one in which we ensure that uh, all, all the partners um, uh, in, in specific regions uh, adhere to fundamental human rights uh, principles and that we support uh, peaceful um, coexistence and we don't ignite or provoke any situation that can lead to tension or lead to disunity, or lead to the situation that can uh, that can be um, detrimental to global peace. And the truth is, when the supply chain is disrupted, when we have wars and you have th that impact uh, the supply of food, the developing world and the poorer countries face the greatest consequence. And uh, and we know how difficult those those consequences can be. The, the developing world has to battle with rising prices for food, fuel, and, 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 and the inflationary pressure it's putting on the people. Peace drives progress, so is natural resources, and in this case, Guyana's newfound oil wealth. The World Bank expects the nation's economy to surge by nearly 50% in 2022, and such growth will potentially transform people's lives. On the other hand, being vulnerable to climate change, Guyana also strives to reduce its carbon footprint. How will the country bring prosperity to its population without sacrificing the environment? Can China be an even stronger partner? Mr. President, I want to talk about the, the new oil resources of your country which has absolutely become the talk of town uh, in many regions of the world. Uh, some estimates put the production output to 11 billion barrels in the past seven years. First of all, is that a, a fair estimate? Well, um, I, 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 I wouldn't give you the, 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 <laughs> uh, the direct number here. Um, I, I don't have the, the direct figure as to what what was the, what is the total production to date? Um, but what I can tell you is that we are going to have uh, a situation by 2027, going on to 2028, where we will be closing in on maybe a million barrel uh, per day. Per day, that would make you uh, the second largest um, oil producer per capita, maybe after yes, Kuwait. Yes. What that gives us now is the opportunity to build out the other sectors, make the other sectors more competitive, to, to, to build a system in the country in which our people can have the best possible education, the best possible healthcare system, our agriculture can be diversified and competitive. We can build out our manufacturing and industrial sector. We can bring down the cost of energy. We can invest in technological transformation, the transformation of the infrastructure landscape of our country the building out of a housing program to support the housing need of every single family, whilst at the same time, we are building a strong institutional framework to protect the revenues from this sector and also to ensure the greatest transparency and accountability. Uh, and all of this is done through uh, an, a mechanism that will have an arm's length relationship from the government and, and, and political influence. So you're basically saying that uh, you want to prevent the resource boom to become the resource curse, which was the case for many countries uh, in the past. 
Some people say it's a resource curse. It can be a resource curse. But if you have resource, it can be a curse. And if you don't have resources, it's also a curse. <laughs> so the problem is never a resource problem. The problem has always been the management of the resources. And that is what is critical. Ensuring that in the management of this resource, there is transparency and accountability to ensure that the system uh, enables the country to develop and widen its economic base. The, the economic pillars on which the country is standing on must be uh, diversified and, uh, and, and the revenue. You must not go on a wild spending spree. That you have to exercise good judgment. You have to exercise good fiscal responsibility. You have, your monetary system has to be strong. These are the things that forms part of the management of resources. It has never been resources that is the curse. It's not a resource curse, it's a blessing. Mr. President, we all know that China is also the world's largest uh, importer of oil. Um, a major exploration uh, country. What kind of energy cooperation do you foresee with China going forward? First of all, we don't believe that uh, there is an immediate end to fossil fuel. But we believe that we must pursue a path of renewable energy. Our forest stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon. It's the size of England. We are pursuing a low-carbon development strategy framework in which renewable energy and uh, climate change is an integral part of what we're doing. So we are also working on a national uh, uh, gas master plan because gas uh, can be uh, an important uh, transitional uh, 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 supplier for, the, uh, for energy. And also we have uh, green hydrogen. So we see China as an important part in the energy equation of our country. We continue to encourage China as we, as we encourage every single one to participate fully in the public process, in the bidding process uh, uh, of, of this um, energy platform that we're developing at a global scale. Your country has launched this Low Carbon Development Strategy 2030, uh, launched by your government. And we also know that China is uh, you know, working very aggressively on its carbon neutrality and carbon peaking goals. Um, how do you see areas of cooperation when it comes to transitioning into you know, a green economy or green economies? Well, I think cooperation is very critical. Uh, as I said, uh, China has technology. They have, in, uh, they have the, <clears throat> the, the uh, resources from a capital perspective, from a human resource perspective, to uh, fast track and accelerate uh, investment in uh, greener uh, energy provider. Uh, for example, hydropower, solar. Um, win. What is a great problem of the developing world is the capital cost uh, for some of these um, alternative energy solutions. And what China uh, has to do is to work at a global scale on supporting these um, alternative energy initiatives. We are also discussing with Suriname the development of an energy corridor that will be linked to northern Brazil. And that itself brings a, a project at a different scale and magnitude that is integrated into the region itself. In 2018, Guyana added another first to the history of bilateral ties when it became the first nation in South America to join the Belt and Road Initiative. According to official data, the focus of BRI in infrastructure, particularly in energy and transport, expanded to about 73% in the first half of 2022 up from 63% in 2021. In some Western critics' eyes, however, such framework is a tool China uses to expand political influence to African and Latin American and Caribbean countries. But many partner countries would tell you that China's approach is very different from their memory of Western colonization. We know that over the years, uh, many reporters in Western news media described China's economic activities and economic uh, investment, for example, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, your country included, as predatory and neo-colonialism. Do you agree? Is that how you feel too, Mr. President? Well, um, if that was how I felt, I would not have been uh, alluding throughout this uh, interview 
to our welcoming uh, nature for Chinese investment and investors. And I would not have, uh, have made the statements that I just made, that we see China, Chinese investment and investors in an, as an important and integral part of the development and advancement of our country. What we want is exactly what uh, I'm sure China wants, is for those investments to bring the greatest benefit to the people of our country and also to support the development and advancement of China. So we see the, the development of our relationship as one that would only get stronger. We see the investment from China as an important part of the uh, investment portfolio and development portfolio of our country moving forward. That is how I see it. Right. In 2021, bilateral trade grew a very impressive 123%, according to the Chinese ambassador to your country, to over $700 million. Um, going forward, in what areas or sectors do you see opportunities for new partnerships with China? Well, you know, there is a lot of opportunities in Guyana, and China is participating from uh, uh, the services and construction sector, and not only uh, uh, public sector uh, construction. You see more Chinese firms now participating in uh, construction from the private sector. So the services industry, the construction sector, agriculture is an important area. Uh, we are seeing more uh, Chinese interests also in agriculture and hospitality, uh, bigger interests, larger, more large scale type of interests. Um, uh, technology, uh, uh, technology transfer, the knowledge economy. Those are areas in the research and development, um, uh, building out of the healthcare system to meet regional requirements. Outside of all of this, of course, we have the oil and gas sector. We'll be auctioning off uh, a number of uh, new blocks uh, closer to the end of this year. And we are hoping that many farms from across the world would participate in that process. We have a gas to shore project now, and many Chinese farms are engaged in that process, uh, in that bidding process for the gas to shore. So the Chinese uh, investors and invest in, in, uh, investment is already in many of these areas. But these uh, are, are some of the areas that you will see more attractive in the future, because we are going to be an integral part of the food security system of the region also. Right. Over the years, China has been trying to provide the world also with a thought leadership, if you will. Uh, we know this BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, which is also an action plan, uh, a community of shared future, and also President Xi Jinping's most recent global development initiative. Um, how do you look at the merits of those Chinese solutions in solving the problems of our world today? Because earlier on, you said we need to take a different approach and a different format to solve many crises of the world. So let's examine uh, some of the global crisis that, that is of interest to everyone today. We have a climate crisis. We have an energy crisis. We have a food crisis. And we have, uh, if you want to put it this way, we have a, uh, a crisis that has always been with us, the inequality crisis. Those are the type of crisis that the world is faced with. The developing world has a rising uh, debt to GDP ratio. We have rising inflation as a result of conditions not created by us. Um, climate change, if you look at the Caribbean, we have contributed the least to, uh, to, um, to the issue of, uh, uh, to the detrimental effects of climate change, but we have, we've we face the worst effects. You look at the food security, it is the same thing for the developing world. We contribute the least to the problem, but we are faced with the greatest uh, impact as a result of the problem. Energy, developing world, many countries still, do, still are not energy secure. Many countries, a high population, uh, a high percentage of the population still don't have access to electricity. You don't have access to power. You don't have access to technology. You don't have access to technology. You don't have access to the transformation. You don't have access to transformation. You don't have access to participate equally in the future uh, 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 and where the world is heading in the future. It's as simple as that. So I think that if you look at these four areas, China can uh, provide its thought leadership. 
and define uh, its path, its global support in these four areas. And once we're able to have a clear direction and a clear vision as to the thought process and the, and the support that China will give in these four areas and how, uh, how they can build a new system. I don't want to say a new world order because that is just a slogan. How we can build a new system that support uh, the world, especially the developing world, in addressing these areas. Uh, going forward, how do you want to sustain and grow this relationship between China and Guyana? We have both committed to growing this relationship. We have both committed to building this relationship. And once we continue to involve people, once we continue to put people at the center of expanding and building this relationship, once we continue to invest in future generations, that is why I keep coming back to the theme of technology transfer, knowledge transfer, opening up these areas, cultural, uh, the cultural exchanges, then the relationship would only get stronger. It cannot get weaker. But if we, uh, if we don't put emphasis and we don't put enough energy on these type of people-centered uh, approach to the development and advancement of the relationship and, and move more to a, tra uh, to a transactional approach to building the relationship, then we will not get the type of benefits both China and Guyana want to get. So I'm saying that the relationship must be bedded in some fundamental values that we both share. And, uh, and once we continue on this trajectory, once we build a, in a bilateral framework that support the areas that I've, spoke, uh, I've spoken about, then uh, you will see the relationship not only getting stronger, but getting more integrated. And, and more structured, and that is what is critical. Dr. Irfan Ali, President of Guyana, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much, it was my pleasure. And again, I congratulate uh, China and Guyana on this important uh, anniversary when we celebrate 50 years of bilateral relationship. And we look forward to working in a stronger, more sustained way as we build stronger bilateral ties and create deeper conditions for the advancement of the people of China and Canada. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you for this interview. That's it for this edition of Leaders Talk. Thank you for watching. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. See you again next time.